customer discovery and product testing starts first with problem definition. One of the most common mistakes I see for new businesses is being unclear about the problem that they're solving for. So for those of you who've already met with me one-on-one -on -one, or if you ever plan to, that will be the first thing I will ask you is what, are the problem you're, is what is the problem that you're solving for? Even if you're developing a vitamin, so what I call vitamin is something that maybe people don't even think about they need or it's not a superpower for them, but it would be helpful, like maybe social media product. Um, you still have a problem that you're trying to solve for, which could just be connecting people or other things that they're trying to deal with. So the number one reasons products fail or businesses fail is because they don't have explore a product market need or they don't really examine what the product market need is. And that really gets down to the root of what is the problem and who is the problem uh, who's suffering from the problem. So let's use a quick example. Um, does anyone know what this is? You can unmute yourself and throw it out there if you know what it is. Nobody? Take a guess. Is it a wheelchair that can climb yeah. stairs? Yeah, well done. So it's a wheelchair that can climb stairs and it was the first iteration of the Segway. And the founder of the Segway uh, came up with this really cool experiment of how can we help disabled folks get up and down the stairs as well as potentially traverse other harder landscapes than flat surfaces. Uh, TAM itself or something like that was not very big. And we all know, especially after taking TAM last semester, having a good TAM is a good idea when you're building a new venture. So they came up with the idea of this, which was let's build something using all the technology that we developed for this stair climbing thing for the U.S. Postal Service. And they sold this concept to the U.S. Postal Service to build about 50,000 of these for postal workers to deliver mail all over the country. Can anyone or does anyone know what happened or guess what happened when they did this? This is actual deal that closed. They signed the contract to do this. So hands up if you've got an idea or you want to guess. Anyone? Tyler, I'm going to cold call you. What do you think happened? Uh, well, we don't see a lot of postal workers riding around on segways. Yeah, that's part. right. So uh, my guess would be either the unions push back or something or Potentially, there was some other third party player that came in that didn't like the idea. Maybe something to do with regulation. Ah. Some market condition type issues, things that happened that prevented this from being successful. Yeah. In fact, what happened was they did no product discovery. So they never actually, nobody in this entire team that built this really beautiful machine sat with or observed postal workers doing their jobs. They didn't talk to them. They didn't ask questions like, how long does it take to deliver? mail on an average route. Turns out it takes about six hours and the batteries that were in these devices were only designed to last for two hours. They were not designed to have a chargeable capability or even to take them out and swap for a new battery. None of that was factored in. They never spent any time with the postal workers to understand how delivering the mail actually worked in practice. Sounds so basic, but these were really smart scientists who were like, it's obvious, look at them. Look how cool they look at the top of a hill cruising around in their segways. It might be the right thing to do, let's do it. It was very embarrassing. It was a multi-million dollar deal. They had contracted with subcontractors to make those tires and all the mechanics inside of it. And they had to completely kill the deal. And as you know, where are we today with Segway? Maybe you see them as like tourist things, but that's about it. it Maybe some traveling police officers, but it is not a big town. They never really reached it. And it really, the beginning was science looking for a problem and no customer discovery to actually validate that that is the problem to solve and that the personas would actually value it. There are a lot of other things, by the way, that happened with the postal workers themselves, not regulatory or union related, but more of a practicality things like carrying the mail to mailboxes in awkward places and those types of things. A lot of that could have been avoided. A lot of money was wasted doing that deal. Okay, so the process of discovery and testing is nonlinear. And by the way, for all 130 so of you that are on this call, if you've signed up to be an entrepreneur and you're used to working linearly, let that go. Because everything you're going to do as an entrepreneur is nonlinear. There's a lot of iteration between problem identification, persona identification, and solution iteration forever. I've, I didn't get into this in the intro, but I've been at three startups that grew to multi-billion dollar businesses and they are still iterating today, decades later. 
So this is something that never stops. Asking the questions that we're going to discover today are things that even mature businesses do. So take the time to do this in the beginning and expect that you're not going to get it right the first time. No matter how smart you are, it takes a lot of iteration and leaning in before you get there. So some of you are familiar with this template, either from Toolkit or I know um, for the Rock Accelerator, you all had to do this. This is a basic template. It's standard. It's not my invention. It's out in, uh, in the world of product for us to be able to define our products, uh, our, our, sorry, our problems with our hypotheses of who we think the, is suffering from the problem and why. So it's a very simple statement of when this happens, we believe that this particular segment, customer, whomever with behavioral attributes have a certain need, a pain point or a need that they have. They're not happy with it. whatever's out there today, or maybe there's nothing out there today because of the following reasons. So in practice, it looks like something like this. So when dressing for special events, we believe that women aged 18 to 35 want a special dress. They're dissatisfied with department store purchases. It's expensive to buy a dress that might only be worn once. And due to embarrassment at being seen on Facebook photos with the same dress twice are the reasons that they're not happy. Who is this? You guys just took 10, so you know who this is. Somebody throw it out there. Right, the exactly. Simple, straightforward. It's a starting point as you're digging into your problem area. What? Who is this? And you will go back and revisit this often. You may have multiples of these, by the way, as you're starting to really do the discovery process and identifying multiple problems that you might want to go after. It can really help with prioritization when you're not sure where to go next. Okay, so problem is the beginning, personas comes after that. And honestly, they're intertwined. So it's not, again, nonlinear, but you're thinking about both in the same time, but often it's start with the problem, then let's think about who's really having that problem. Okay. Most often I see one to two personas identified with a problem for each. Typically the problems overlap, they're similar, or in some cases you have a, a marketplace that you're developing where it's a two-sided market and you have two different problems that are solving. I would love for a couple of you, I'm sure with 130 plus of you, there are a couple of marketplaces among us. Uh, can I get a volunteer or two to tell me who they're in the marketplace example, who are the two sides and who are the two personas? Like what are the two problems and the two personas that they're trying to deal with? Otherwise I'm gonna ask Emily or Ben to pull on a, a marketplace person. Can I get a volunteer? How about you, Allie? I know you're dealing with two sides. Who are the two players in your market today and, and the two problems? Um, two sides currently are young kids that play sports and want more sports development. And then the other side of it is um, ex-athletes that want to coach on the side. So okay. trying to match those two. Okay, so what is the problem for the ex-athlete, former athlete? Uh, the problem for the ex-athlete is that they have like ideally a working profession and limited time to spend marketing themselves to young kids and finding kids, but want to coach on the side. Okay, so is the problem marketing? Uh, the problem is, I think, the time that it takes to market themselves and not knowing who to market to. Okay, is that the problem? That they're going to sign up for your product because they're not sure that you're going to tell them how to market? Or is There's it the problem that they're not getting customers? Um... I think it's, the problem is that um, marketing, I think, is part of it. The other part of it is finding available space to conduct these sessions. So there's kind of like multiple factors that the coaches themselves have to think through in order to conduct the sessions. And because of like the conglomeration of all of those factors, it's kind of too much and they throw their hands up and say, I don't want to do it anymore. Gotcha. So finding the kids, finding the space, figuring out payments is a hassle. Lots of problems, lots of problems. Then that's just one side of the market, right? Then there's the other side of the market, which is? Young kids who are 
currently have a slew of athletic endeavors and probably either face with travel teams or school teams that um, they're involved with and they want to develop more, but their development is very dependent upon the team that they're on, the coach that they have. And they don't have an easy way to find a reputable coach that they want to work with. Right. And P.S. and, and Ali, I'm cheating because Ali and I have had a number of conversations about this. We're not just talking about the kid, but there's probably another persona in here, which yeah. is the kid's parents who are trying to help them schedule or are eventually going to pay for whatever coaching services that they find. Right. So separate and distinct what the ex or former athlete, uh, professional athlete needs or what their pain points are, which could be multiple, very different than uh, the consumer side, which could be, again, multiple. So my point of bringing that up is we have to narrow that down, especially when we're focusing on an MVP. There may be lots of these out there. Even if you get into pro athletes in Ali's example, you know, a tennis athlete who's doing tennis coaching could be very different than someone who's doing a lacrosse team, which is, could be whole team oriented thing, right? So even that can be complicated. Primary personas, who are we starting with and their problems potentially identifying secondary personas and their problems and where they overlap. And then PS, whoops, my mouse wasn't working. Tertiary problems, anti-personas, other problems, it's complicated. I call out anti-personas here because it's as important to identify who's primary, who's secondary, who's tertiary. Maybe we'll get to them someday, but not right away. And anti is, we're not gonna work on a problem for them. They're out there, good to note them. They may overlap with other problems that overlap with who we are focused with, but we are very consciously not going to solve their problems. That is as important as who you are solving for. So identify the problem and the personas and narrow your scope. Great to note the other ones that are out there, but if you start spending all your time on all of them, you're going to end up with a diffuse product that ends up trying to solve for too many things at once. It's a great goal to get there, but not in the beginning when you're in early discovery. Okay, so what and why for personas? What is their fictional archetypal type customers? It's excellent when you can develop stories around them, understand their goals, their motivations, and all this discovery work we're going to talk about further is the research that validates all of this, that builds the character that you're trying to solve the problem for. They should seem like real people. It's not only helpful for you all as founders, but as you start to build a team, because you're all gonna be rock stars and super successful, it will help build empathy for your whole team to rally around who are we doing this for. It will focus your design teams, marketing, sales, and support. This is not just about building a product. And no matter what product you're building, it doesn't have to be a tech product. It could be a consumer good. It could be a nonprofit service. You should still be identifying this. Okay, three to five are typical, one to two are primary. And going back to Ali's example, one to two primary could be on the coach side, on the, you know, the, the former athlete side and one to two could be on the kid side. Allie may also have one to two on the parent side, right? They're all primary for their various segments, but what you're not having is five or six for each of those, because again, you're just trying to solve for too much. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, note buyers versus users versus marketplaces. It's okay if you segment them out by each of these areas. Who buys your product could be a different per persona, especially if you're doing enterprise SaaS type product or any kind of enterprise product B2B, where the buyer could be a VP of engineering and the user could be an engineer, uh, or the HR department is going to use a product, but the CIO has to actually buy it for the business. Those are different personas to be identifying as well. Okay, you mentioned anti-personas. Um, yeah, so before I get into more on customer discovery, questions from anybody on problem definition and persona identification. And please use the hand raise feature so you pop to the top so I see you if you've got a question. No question is done, by the way. If you're thinking it, other people are probably thinking of it. Ayushi, go ahead. So I've been talking to oncologists and I've been getting like conflicting personas and wondering if you had any advice for like where to start and if your user interviews are sort of leading to like conflicting personas, like 
how do you begin to solve like that problem? And you're saying, can you say a little bit more about the conflicting? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so um, for context, I'm working on this question of how do we connect diverse patients to clinical trials? And so I'm speaking with oncologists who come from a variety of different backgrounds, like geographies, um, to also like private practice versus community hospital versus academic researcher. And so when I'm talking to them about their patients, they just have very different personas and they'll tell me conflicting things, such as um, one doctor will say like, oh yeah, like our low income patients actually really struggle to kind of follow the trial through because they don't have access to reliable transportation. But then I'll also hear, oh, actually our low income patients um, are most likely to kind of follow the trial all the way through because they're compensated financially for it. Ah. And so that's conflicting to me and I'm not sure how to create this persona when I'm hearing conflicting ah. reasons. Yeah. Got it, got it, brilliant. So this is why we do this iteration of problem definition, persona definition, and let's go validate that. So you've heard a lot of hypotheses that are conflicting. The best way to know really what's right or wrong is to start doing some experiments to find out what's true. And their lenses and their perspectives versus what's actually happening with these patients could be very different. And understanding, going back to goals and motivations, what I'm hearing is a lot of signal that's saying, I need to go find out what's really going on with these patients. And it might mean I have to go talk to a bunch of them or do some of these experiments we're going to talk about in a minute to validate what is actually happening that the doctor might not see. Or to identify, like, of the, of the tests I've run, most of them are actually leaning more towards what this doctor said versus what that doctor said. Does that make sense? It does, yes. Thank okay. you so much for clarifying that. Yeah, sure thing. Alec? Yeah, I had, um, I think, a question that's probably relevant to a lot of folks working in the healthcare space of mm -hmm. doing customer discovery for patients first, which are going to be your users, but they're not going to be the buyers. And your advice for early on in, in the discovery process, is it best to try to find both at once or to start with just the user problems and down the line figure out the buyer side of things? Yeah, great question. Um, here's, here's a way to think about it. If you think that the buyer is the barrier to entry, then you might wanna start doing some experimentation with the buyer just to understand what those barriers are. And again, we can talk more about what those experiments might be um, and we get to, as we get into later in the session. Uh, if you feel like I'll figure it out at some point, who, who's gonna actually buy it and how, I would say the one thing I would absolutely say is do not all of you on this call stress about pricing yet. I know you hear a lot about that in TEM and in bootcamp. Uh, my personal bent is you have no idea what you're, most of you have, are doing yet. So to price it is kind of silly and willingness to pay you, haven't, you don't really know what you're delivering yet. So I would say in terms of pricing, validating willingness to pay, understanding the buyer process, you could do, if it's a complicated healthcare system, you could do some experiments to just, and we can talk about that through ethnography and some of the things I, I had you guys read to kind of understand what the buying process is in a healthcare organization or in sure tech or whatever it is that you're doing. But going too deep on that when you're not really sure yet what you're building might be premature. Does that make sense? Super helpful, thank you. Okay, sure thing. All right, and look, there was another question. I might, maybe I just answered that through um, through that. So let's keep going. Okay, I don't know why my mouse and my buttons are not working great. So talk, let's talk about talking to customers. We don't do this when we go talk to customers. And my toolkit people have seen this beautiful image before. So we don't just figure out who they are and just say like, tell me what you want. I know you have a problem, just tell me what you want and I'm just gonna figure it out. But it's not that simple. They're not gonna tell us. There's a book called The Mom Test. I don't know, Ben or Emily, did, did y'all buy this book for all these fabulous people for the summer? We did not, actually. You did not. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. If you took Toolkit, you already have it. And if you take my course in the fall, I'm buying it for you. So no worries. But it also uh, is available if you do some Googling, you might be able to find it um, pretty easily in a PDF somewhere. I know this is being recorded, but I'm just gonna throw that out there. It's a very simple book. Um, I should get royalties because I talk about it a lot, but I don't. Um, the mom test is a terrible title. It, it alludes to like your mom can use your product. That's not what it means. It means don't ask your mom for advice or feedback on your product because you're probably going to get very biased feedback. 
So I'm not going to break down the entire book, but what I am going to do is give you some highlights and things to think about as we talk to customers. Talking to customers is usually the first place all of you start. If I was to do a poll right now, my guess is about 85% of you would say that's the discovery work you've done so far is talking to customers. There's nothing wrong with talking to customers, but in and it of itself, you have not really validated anything. You've just gotten the ball rolling. So if you're going to do that, you will. You'll always be talking to customers. Do it right. So first goal, learn, don't pitch. You are not selling anything yet. Your goal right now, especially in these early stages, is to just understand and listen. So listen more than you talk. Use open-ended questions, right? Tell me about the last time that. Walk me through. Anything that's open and allows your customers to talk more about what they're seeing versus being very data-driven and telling you exact things because they will not probably have that information. Listen and look for emotion and frustration. That is gold. When you're asking questions, especially if you're on video or you're able to actually see them in person, body language will tell you so much. It will start to, if you say, tell me about the last time this happens and they go like this, You've just hit something painful. That can be a real signal to, oh, interesting, tell me more. I wanna know what about that just made you make that body language thing happen. Or it's a signal as you're talking to lots of customers, like when we ask this question, all of them roll their eyes. Huge, massive, great way to actually get more insight on what's happening with your customers. Five whys, I believe you all had a case maybe last year that. Uh, dug into the five whys a bit, but the whole point of it is to explore root causes, go deeper. When they say something that's sort of new or interesting, tell me more about that. And then when it happens after that and say more, and what else do you see? The more you can dig into things, the more you're likely to hear about little details that maybe the customer or the prospective customer didn't think to tell you. And as they're going through it, it's starting to uncover new things for you. It can also help with that example uh, that was asked before about what doctors are saying about their patients. A deeper, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, you could end up converging on some patterns and saying, oh, I see. Once we got down to it, we found out really actually these are the same things, right? Uh, don't be afraid to go deeper. Again, going into past behaviors versus not opinions and intentions. I call opinions and intentions, especially on the intention side, crystal balling. When we ask how likely are you to versus when did you last, we are asking people to predict their behavior. The likelihood of them being accurate and actually doing the thing that they say they're going to do is very small. So when I hear, uh, oh, I talked to 20 customers, they all said they're totally going to buy my product if I make it, that's a false positive. Will they actually do it is when we get into the other discovery techniques of let's, let's actually see what they'll actually do versus what they say they will do. People lie. They don't mean to lie. They want to make you happy. They want to get the answer correct. They're more likely to just give you something you want to hear than what you actually need to know is, tell me what you used to do or tell me how you solve it today. So be careful about asking for any predictive behavior because you're likely not going to get anything accurate. I mentioned open-ended questions, avoid leading questions. Uh, never say things like, wouldn't you agree that this is a problem? Or don't you think it sucks that? You want to avoid anything like that. It's very biased. Kind of obvious, but I see it happen all the time with interviews. Make sense? Okay. So let's talk about how we find our customers. Um, I'm curious today how you all are finding your customers. Um, let's throw out some examples. It, let's, we can start with those a lot of you said are in healthcare. How are you finding these patients or doctors today? Raise your hand so I can call on you, please. I'm assuming you're all talking to people. So give me some examples of how you're finding them or how you have found them to date. Andrew? Or wait, who is it? We got Eric. Oh, sorry, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I think most of them, I find them by like just watching and uh, like the daily lives and analyzing like, uh, yeah, like the daily routine and how they um, uh, express and 
like viewing the, the body language is like my, my, like my main uh, approach to, to get them. How are you finding, I, I hate to interrupt, but tell me more about who are they and how are you finding them? Where, where, sure. where, where did you even find them? Sure, yeah. So mo most of like our main persona that we're like um, trying to like targeting uh, right now is like um, urban young professionals. Mm -hmm. So we just go to the, the buildings, to the office buildings, and go to the lobbies, and then analyze like their like their routine, and then ask them if um, if they want to have one. Uh, well, we are building a coffee shop uh, chain, mm. so we are like asking them like, hey, how often do you um, buy a, a Starbucks coffee, or do you buy one one of them at all, or do you buy a coffee from from another store? And then just like instead of just like hearing their 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 words, we we'll like look more to their um, facial expressions. That we, we think like um, most of most of the of the answers in the in the face rather than in the than in the okay. um, in the words, right? Good. Okay. The key here, and I'd love to hear some other examples. Is, is you're doing one of my favorite things, which is I call it creepy stalking, which is like hanging out where they are and observing them in their natural habitats and maybe approaching them at randomly and just asking them questions. Well, well done. Uh, who else? Shriti or Shrishti, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, hi, Julia. So I'm trying to build uh, something in the personal wealth management space for young professionals, uh, ideally people who are in their first, second, third jobs. And I think what I found like surprisingly very useful was like I reached out to people on LinkedIn yeah. And, uh, uh, and I think like I received like an overwhelming response, uh, but at least just showed that this conversation is important to people and there are people beyond my networks also who are reaching out to me. And I try to kind of make sure to do like a Zoom call with them rather than uh, doing like a telephonic call so that I can like look at uh, yep. their expressions or their body language as I'm speaking to them. Wonderful. So you're using LinkedIn as a way to, and it's very like, I'm assuming blind, just like throwing things out there. And yes. See Onto it. Wonderful. That's right. Great, That's great, right. great examples of ways to get out there and find folks. Here's just a few pro tips for you. I already mentioned professional settings, conferences, trade shows, journals, online forums like LinkedIn, daily life settings, parks, bars, restaurants, malls, campuses, not HBS. There's this tendency with our students, and I love y'all, but like you're right here. I'm just talking to you. You're in my target persona group, or you're in the right demographic. I'm just going to talk to you because it's easy. There's a challenge with uh, talking to your classmates, which is bias. You, they can't help it. Y'all are exceptional human beings, first of all. You're not probably the average consumer who's going to, or business person, or business owner who's going to use your product. Um, but it also just gets you or keeps you too close to your comfort zone. And again, being an entrepreneur is not only nonlinear, but it also is uncomfortable. And going out there and talking to strangers is something you've got to get used to and do more often. So again, hanging out where they are and not being tempted, unless you're building a product for HBS students, they should not be the first people that uh, you're talking with because it's convenient. You certainly can do certain tests and I can share more about that later. And uh, if you're building something like a physical product, I had a student last year who was building a physical product where using her cl classmates to test the physical product itself just to see how it functioned is fine. But if you're trying to do discovery work and validate the personas and the problems using your, your colleagues is probably not a good idea. Okay, find where they congregate, where they're watering holes, where do they hang out? You might find out they have uh, Reddit groups they belong to or Slack groups that they belong to, anything goes. You're trying to just find where they hang out so that you can get them en masse. Uh, referrals, something that I think a lot of folks miss is when you are interviewing them is to ask anybody you're interviewing, who else should I talk to? Who do you know who may also have this problem? Who else in your network is somebody um, who could be useful in some kind of way or has other people to talk with? Each other, as you all are out doing rock activities this summer and you run into people who might you're starting to learn about what each of you are building right you might meet someone you're like you know what this is not somebody i need to talk to for my product but oh my gosh i know somebody in our program who would totally benefit from talking with you those that is also gold when you have those opportunities to help each other out i love the stories of the founders are like i met this person through my section mate or through someone who did rock summer fellow with me and i never would have met them otherwise could be somebody's already in your network or it could be somebody you, you bumped into who could be useful so 
tap into all of these options, um, but also be safe and legal. Don't break any laws. So creepy stalking, but only only in a way that isn't uh, going to break the law. We don't want you to get in trouble. Although I have certain crazy stories of what some students have done. Okay, so I already asked that question. Um, let's talk about beyond the interview. So interviews are great. I'm not saying don't do them, but I'm also saying if you do them exclusively, you're not going to learn anything. Also, if you do them exclusively, you will not get in my class in the fall if you're thinking about taking it because I won't accept any students who just spent the summer interviewing. Okay, low fidelity testing, my favorite. This is where we get into the very scrappy, cool things that you can do to really validate those problems and those personas. We do them to prove hypotheses and testing solutions. Low fi testing is good for both. Uh, we're asking the question, are assumptions about the persona or the problem correct? Are we making the right assumptions? Are we learning something new? Um, and whether or not the solution will work. The beauty of low fidelity testing is it's usually low cost. And if you find out your assumptions are wrong or a solution won't work, you didn't spend a lot of money or time building something for no reason. And I'm, again, going to give you a bunch of examples of this in a minute. Concierge versus Wizard of Oz test. I know my toolkit folks know what this is, but uh, who can give us a quick, quick definition of the concierge test versus the Wizard of Oz? Can I get a volunteer, please? Y'all are shy. Charles, how about you? I'm going to give a try on what the definition is of concierge versus a Wizard of Oz test. I can't hear you. Can you unmute? Or can someone unmute Charles? No? There you are. Uh, let me know if this isn't working because my headphones have nope, been working recently. Fine. So, concierge versus Wizard of Oz test. What's the difference? Um, I could be wrong, but uh, from what I remember from the reading, I believe it has to do with how you position, whether you're knowingly involved in the interview process. Uh, so whether the the person that you're kind of seeing their experience, the product, whether you're actually in the middle of that as an intermediator versus if you're just watching that separately, but I could be wrong there. A, a good shot, close, but not quite there. Anyone else want to take a run at it? Uh, isn't like Wizard of Oz testing like what Uber did? Basically, like you would call, but you actually had no idea what was going on in the background, even though they were doing the calling and stuff themselves. Whereas concierge, like the customer already knows how the operations are working in the forefront of the product. Well done. Well done. So, yes, Charles, you were close. The, the goal of the Wizard of Oz test is to imagine this is happening for realsies, even though it isn't. So, the Uber example of I'm texting some, I think, an app that's actually sending a car to come pick me up, which actually, you know, in the background, Travis had like a, a whole system of people and dispatch systems and cars lined up and was doing all the mapping and everything manually in the back end, but the customer didn't know all of that was happening. Concierge could be like, hey, for the next week, we're going to send we're going to send you a car every time you need a car, just tell you, you know, tell us where you are, we'll pick you up and we'll drop you off, in which case they know you're doing it for them. These are, and, and Charles, a nuance of what you had said is, these are not interviews. These are actual tests. These are experiments where you're actually trying some of the things or testing the hypotheses that you have around personas or problems um, versus just interviewing. Transparency versus behind the curtain. Um, as you're doing these tests, it's important to be thinking about the scope and the plan for each test. Uh, I see this often happen where I'm going to run a test. And I'm going to test every possible thing that's going to happen. A classic example is a travel solution. I don't know if anybody's doing travel this year. But travel could be, I'm going to help someone plan their trip. Travel could be, I'm going to help somebody share their photos after their trip. Or it could be everything from I'm going on a trip, I think, to I finished the trip, to my life as a traveler. I want to keep everything in one place. When we're running tests and experiments or even interviews, it's important to try to slice it out a little bit and really get to know each part of the journey. And I'm going to give you a, a pro tip for that later on how to do that. But scope it out. What do we want to learn right now? What is the thing that we really need to know? And what part of, in the Uber example, in the early days, it was just like, will a person actually trust a stranger to pull up 
and, and will they get in their car? That alone is a test. Will a stranger get into another stranger's car? Airbnb did the same thing. Chesky spent a ton of time just understanding, like, would someone sleep on a mattress in some random person's house? Before we get into what photos are going to make the product appealing or what kind of characteristics do people have to share about the particular unit you're Airbnb being, all that other stuff is interesting discovery work. But in the early stages, you're just testing things like human behavior and understanding, or even in the case of the, the doctor clinical trial patient situation of what, does that, what test could we design to know like what's really happening with these patients when they're signing up for a clinical trial or not, right? Getting really simple. Uh, on the variable side, and I'll touch on this again a little bit um, in a minute, too many variables will end up confusing you on what's working and what's not. Another reason to really slice out the journeys and test very specific things with very specific personas. So if you have, using the rent the runway example, an 18-year-old is very different than a 35-year-old when it comes to renting a dress, I would guess, right? And what a 13-year-old or, I'm sorry, 18-year-old might want to wear to the prom versus what a 35-year-old might want to wear to a wedding. I would argue those are two different tests. Let's really get specific about those two personas and understand what makes them different or the same versus munging 18 to 35 year olds together. We might not get all the things that we need to get or even a prom, what someone needs for prom versus what someone needs for a wedding could be very different as well. Those are each individual tests. It will feel arduous and slow and long to do this. My experience is when you spend 80% of your time doing things like this, you will spend 20% of your time building the right thing. If you spend 80% of your time just building, 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 you're going to just spend, you're going to have very little time and probably run out of money to do anything that you really need to do that's accurate and correct for those personas. Okay. As you're doing these tests, and by the way, I'm happy to share a template uh, with all of you. Uh, Emily and Ben, remind me, I have that for you guys as well. Uh, the more detail, the better when you're doing these tests. Who are we doing this? What questions are we trying to answer? What props do we need? What script are we using? Again, sounds arduous. This is real research work. This is the thing that's going to validate whether you should be building something or not. Okay. With all of that, you also want measurements. And that can be tricky because sometimes it's a bit of a swag, a, a scientific wild ass guess. Sorry, that's a real term. I don't know, we think this is gonna happen. 50% of the people we test with will do foo, whatever that is. Uh, or we were looking for at least 75% to click on a button because um, it's telling us interest, which is still just interest, but at least that's what we're looking for. Proving your assumptions, trying to measure if a behavior has changed, how many people actually got in the stranger's car when it pulled up. We'd like to have at least, you know, if we're running 10 tests, we'd like to have at least seven of them be willing to get into the car. Let's just see what happens, right? If only two get into the car, it's a signal for you to say like, should we run the test, test differently? Or, or did we just say like, people are not willing to do this? Or what would we have to change? One variable would we have to change that would make them more likely to get in the car than they did before? If you change three variables, then you won't be sure what actually changed. So in the case of getting in the car using the Uber example again, if it's just, we're gonna give a profile of the driver and see if that's enough to get them into the car, no, that wasn't enough. Okay, what else could we do? Add another thing. If you added three bits of data about the driver or the driver plus the destination plus the, maybe the health of the vehicle and they get start getting in the car, you might not be sure what thing actually compelled them to get in the car. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Every, day, every bit of data should also be tangible. Okay. Moving on to other discovery methods. Let's go to ethnography first. Ethnography, observation, sort of goes back to what Eric was saying. Sorry, my mouse is wacky. Um, Eric was saying what he does when you, are you're in lobbies of buildings, Eric, is that where you were? Yeah. Yeah, right. right. So ethnography, observation is also gold. Just, can I just sit and watch what you do, right? Or sitting in a lobby or in a coffee shop or wherever those watering hole places are that your personas are and just watching their behavior can tell you a lot, right? It could be the opening to a, I noticed as soon as you got in line, you opened up your phone and you opened such and such an app, right? It could be if it's a B2B app, it could be sitting next to a salesperson who's keying in data into Salesforce and noticing them opening their drawer, looking at some sheet they have in their drawer and you saying, that's what's that? 
and them saying, oh, it's a coding thing that I do and whatever, that they may not have told you in an interview that they do, the subtle little workarounds and things that they do. Also asking them to talk out loud. This is great, by the way, when if you're following anybody on Zoom as they're doing things or watching things to ask them to talk out loud. Tell, you're, you're planning a trip. As you're starting to Google for your destinations and your hotels or whatever, I want you to talk out loud as you're doing that. I want to hear your process. I'm looking for this. Oh, tell me more about what you're looking for. You know, I want a hotel that's cheap. Tell me more about what cheap means, right? Oh, I'm searching the filters or I'm setting are between, you know, less than $400 a night. Got it. Okay, tell me more about what you're doing. Just observing like that will start to give you insights that you wouldn't have through an interview process. Regarding surveys, surveys are hard and often done wrong. They also are often asking future questions, that crystal ball-y kind of thing versus looking in the past and getting data. So my general pro tip on surveys is always ask for things more in the past than in the future and always ask for things that are more data-oriented versus subjective information. So if you're just trying to capture the like, you know, if you're doing a clothing product, like when was the last time you bought a new coat? What's the average price you've paid for a coat? Then you're getting real data. If it's like, if you could have any coat, what would you buy? That's not going to be a great survey question. Okay. Hard to do. Also, I could spend a whole session on surveys. I'm not going to do that. More than 10 questions is not a survey. It's just arduous. And most people, I know I don't want to answer a survey that's more than 10 questions. The first question should be like any basic demographic that's relevant and important, although then otherwise just don't waste their time. And the last question should always be something like, can we follow up with you if we have more questions or, and, or who else do you know who should we, we should talk with in a survey? But surveys alone, again, can be not done well and could give you a lot of false positives. Okay. Last one, social media and landing pages. I have a lot of feels about this one and students who've had me before know this already. Uh, social media and landing pages are great. I know you learned a lot about how to do them if you did boot camp. Um, not saying not do them. However, what they are doing is telling you interest and maybe helping you source your personas. Maybe you're getting some emails that you can use to do follow up testing, which is great, but in it of itself is not going to teach you much. Right. So, again, if I hear, I spent a lot of time this summer interviewing customers or prospective customers, and I have a landing page and I ran some Facebook ads, you don't have a company. And you probably don't know much or enough about what the real problems are and who your personas are. It's a nice start, but by itself, it's not going to give you enough insight. So I'm not saying don't do social media and landing pages, but those are not business problem solving approaches. They're a nice way to augment the discovery process, but not truly discovery. Okay. Thank you. Before I give you some examples, any questions on this? And then I'm going to walk you through a couple examples of great tests that some of our former students have done. Pratik, go ahead. Hi, would you also recommend um, starting with um, reviews of substitutes and other competitors? For example, I was thinking of looking at the negative reviews of other existing solutions. Uh, that people have left on, let's say, app platforms, try to get insights from that. Do you think that's a valid way to spend my time or should I go completely greenfield and ask them up, like bottom up? What, what, uh, what is I think it's another great way to do discovery work is market research like that and seeing negative comments is sending some sort of signal that people are not happy. There's a pain point somewhere or people are not happy with things. I don't think that's a bad thing to do. And by the way, I also think it's great if you ask people to walk you through the competitor's product and how they're using it today without even telling them it's because you're thinking of buying or building something that's going to compete with it. It's just like, oh, you use Salesforce? I'd love to see how you use Salesforce. And like you really, or some tool that they're using today where you just like, show me what you do um, yep. and, and just see what they say and have them talk out loud as they do it. I think that can be wonderfully insightful, but in and of itself is not a way to really validate what you're building. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. it makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, hey, um, Udit here. I, I had one question. Uh, a lot of this is catered towards a B2C kind of a setting. Uh, I find that it's a little harder to understand what the pain point itself is or find uh, customers 
uh, for a B2B context, right? If you're trying to build something and sell to enterprise, uh, it's also hard to, let's say, identify uh, decision makers and people who will actually want the problem solved and things like that. So it gets a little more complicated. So any advice for a B2B kind of setting? Okay, so are we talking about finding them or are we talking about testing with them or both? Both, ideally, but even finding them. Uh, okay. I mean, your approaches of LinkedIn and stuff, I guess, works. Uh, but also, if you already don't have anything, uh, at least I find that you end up talking to uh, people who are sort of the users, but also, I guess, the complication comes from decision makers and buyers being different uh, than the end users. And yeah. so it's hard to say what problem is worth solving and things like that, right, in a B2B setting. Sure, sure, sure. Well, first of all, everything that I've listed is 100% B2B and B2C, right? And I come from purely a B2B background. So this all actually resonates deeply with me for all the things that I've done. So let's let's translate that, right? Even in ethnography, as I mentioned, if you're building a new sales tool, you would be looking for sales reps or sales managers or people who are like heads of sales or whatever to and potentially going on the road with them if you want to understand their sales process, if they actually go out and, and sell or listening to being uh, on phone calls and asking if you can shadow people as they're doing a sales call to understand how they do sales today. Or a great example from one of our former students, uh, alumni from years ago, uh, who built a business uh, intelligence tool, you know, like a Tableau type of tool. He just found a lot of people who ran inside sales teams and just asked if he and his co-founder could sit and watch what happens uh, in the room, or in the case of Zoom, it could be like partnering with people one at a time. But back then, when we were not as virtual as we are today, uh, sat in the office uh, of many different sales teams and just observed what they were doing. And they identified that they kept putting things on a whiteboard that turned out to be a sales leader, like a leaderboard for the inside sales team that then let, that, let them realize that they might want something that isn't just on a whiteboard that's messy and, and hard to update. And their scrappy low fidelity testing was creating Excel spreadsheets that look like pretty graphs for a few weeks with these inside sales teams to get the manager's feedback on whether they were useful or not. And that was a little bit of a WAS test because um, well, it was kind of a concierge meets WAS because they knew they were doing it, but they didn't realize what they were doing on the back end is just using Excel with a bunch of data and creating pretty dashboards but it was a way for them to realize this is what people want. We can create a tool that does this. So I do think it's from a testing standpoint, almost all of these would apply in B2B. From finding them, it's with, with enterprise, it's a lot of networking. It's a lot of finding warm intros. Uh, I just had a student from last year reach out to me. She's building a product for VPs of engineering in middle market companies. And she just creepy stalked my network, which I'm fine with. If I've met you, I'm happy to connect with you on LinkedIn and you can do that, but I have to have met you. Um, and ask for an intro to a VP of engineering. It's a lot of like roll up your sleeves and uh, for lack of a better term, sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat when it comes to getting those introductions. So do you think you're just, you're going to have to just go to conferences, go to events, find out where they hang out and, and push. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Okay, good, 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 good. And we can talk more about this, but this is, yeah, it, it's definitely harder, but um, very doable. Okay. So let's go through a couple examples of past students. And these are also um, both B2B and B2C. So in the case of June, which is now called Seven Starling, these were students who wanted to, initially they wanted to create a virtual doula uh, opportunity for helping pregnant families. Uh, before the pandemic, so uh, worked out really well for them when, unfor you know, unfortunate event of the pandemic worked out well for them as a business because then everybody needed to be online. But they simply just put flyers all over Boston uh, with these nice little QR codes and tried to find people who were looking for doulas just to understand what they were looking for. And then they did the matching process and concierged finding doulas for these folks. And then once they had critical mass, they were able to actually start testing things like online doula, doula support and what would that take and how much education do people want and need and all those other things. But just to get the ball rolling, to find the consumers and connect them with the doulas, they did this simple flyer. Easy and great way to just be scrappy. Uh, the wager team was coming up with a new way to do betting with friends. So um, legal betting in the states where it's allowed, uh, do people wanna bet with their friends as opposed to bet with the house? for uh, sports. 
I'm not a big betting person, but this is as much as I understand what they were doing. Their approach was to actually go to bars, sports bars, and create all sorts of fun betting games and ask random people who were with their friends watching games to just do betting and just see what happened. Just all in fun. They would pay for the tab, but they're actually scrappy and in bars running low fidelity tests to understand what do friends actually do with each other. They knew what they did, but they wanted to understand more what other like random strangers do with betting. Uh, the Helping Handle team was trying to support uh, cashless donations to the homeless. So they stood in Harvard Square with signs and they tested all different ways for people to donate money to the homeless using Venmo. Lots of experiments with like, what if we give a flyer and it gives more information about this homeless person. They partnered with the various folks in Harvard Square who were willing to do that with them. And they learned a ton about the behavior of people who want to give. And the reality was they learned that people actually will give a lot more money later than in the moment if you give them a Venmo opportunity to, uh, to do that. So they got out in the street and they did it. The smoothie team, smoothie, uh, one of my former students who wanted to create a smoothie machine for inside offices with the idea that just like we have a Keurig machine or other machines in our office kitchens, also pre-pandemic, uh, what if we had a smoothie machine? He was ready to build the machine. I encouraged him instead to spend his Rock Summer Fellowship making smoothies for people in various offices and testing things like add-ins and what types of flavors people liked and kind of questions they asked about the health benefits and all these other things before he built a single machine. That was a really fun one. And then last but not least, uh, Hack Your Sleep was an event that one of my former students did back in my, it was 2017, I think. Um, she was trying to discover or solve for sleep problems. She didn't know anything about sleep herself. She just thought there was sleep was a problem for a lot of people. And what if we had a marketplace or a way to connect people with better mattresses or therapy or a wearable or whatever it is? Uh, they might need. So she ran an event at HBS. She put flyers all over Boston in all the teaching hospitals, sleep study labs, uh, various places, and just said, if you want to hack your sleep and learn more about sleep, she invited a few experts to come and speak. She took over a big space in the iLab and just saw who showed up. And she learned, she not only learned a ton about what people cared about around sleep and the experts, but she built her network. Going back to Udi's question, with experts in the field she had no connections to before. All really scrappy ways to learn and discover and make the, her, their products better. Where all of them are now, uh, Helping Handle was a great experiment. They learned it was really hard and banking being the biggest issue for the homeless folks is getting the money into a bank account and being able to have them get access to it was hard and was too too much for them to solve. So they they killed the idea. But the other ones have, are all crushing right now. Uh, Seven Starling, and not that raising is the only measure of success, but certainly is a great measure, uh, has uh, raised three and a half. Wager just exited. Yahoo Sports just bought the product or bought the company uh, re very recently in the last few weeks. Um, Hack Your Sleep became human first. It's a, an amazing wearable technology business. And uh, Smoothie is actually pivoted from selling uh, smoothie machines inside of offices to um, convenience stores and um, roadside stops. So like the, the stores we or the, the rest area stops that we go to on the highways, uh, we're all looking for solutions for something. Uh, people wanted something healthier than the junk food that's usually in those places. So left offices, which actually ended up again, working in their favor after the pandemic, but um, have a thriving business now with smoothie machines all over highways, which is kind of cool. One more example I wanna give you, and then we're gonna get ready to do breakouts where you can talk about your own experiments. Um, another former student of mine, Amelia, uh, she did the left HBS to go get a job job while she thought about an idea that she wanted to create because she didn't really have something while she was at HBS. Uh, she, Amelia is a developer. She's actually a software engineer and is able to build technology. However, she had an idea around business, I mean, I'm sorry, around consumers sharing ideas uh, and stories with their family around, uh, not ideas, but um, generational stories. Like, tell me about how you and mom met or her parents were uh, Chinese Americans, uh, grandparents had immigrated. I'd like to hear, you know, grandparents immigration story. And how do we capture that? And how will people want to capture that? She had a lot of hypotheses around video versus audio recordings of these stories. So even though she was technical and she could have built something, 
She instead very simply did experiments using both Skype, um, because that was a hot thing back then, and SoundCloud to test the theory of who wants to be on audio versus actually uh, record video. And she stored everything in Dropbox and then just used a really scrappy way to share everybody's stories with their families just to see the human behavior around all of that. And what happened with that was a lot of insight. Definitely she learned people don't want to do um, video. They, they were just, people didn't want to, vanity issues. They just didn't want to be on video, but they were perfectly happy to share stories and audio. So she knew she needed to create an audio recording product. As things evolved, she, had, she realized she had a larger and larger concentration of moms who wanted to share baby stories, which was unexpected. And in the last year and a half or so, she's completely pivoted the business. And now it's called Honeycomb. Uh, she quit her day job, by the way, a couple of years ago, raised a bunch of capital. And Honeycomb is for um, families to share all the stories and, and milestones and activities with their kids. Uh, so not only to have as records for their kids when they become adults, but for grandparents and friends and what have you. So it was an interesting series of experiments that led to not only building a product that was um, useful and appropriate for the consumer she was going after, but also gave her insight to pivot. Okay, that was a lot, I know, but I wanted to give you a whole sense of different things you can do and ways you can experiment beyond the interview. So with that in mind, I mentioned doing these um, with limited variables, you don't need to do a lot. So five, if you do these tests, all the tests I just talked about, if you get down to five and you want to run a test to test a certain hypothesis that you have, you will get the answers that you need. So using the example of um, the, the doulas, if all they were asking is, will people do a consultation, virtual consultation with a doula, all we want to know is if they'll do the call for 30 minutes, you only need to do five of those. If they then had a whole bunch of other questions about what kind of doula or where they were in their pregnancy or all those other things, then they would have to do different sets of five for those questions that they have. You don't need to do 100, you don't need to do 1,000, you need to do only five to understand whether you're leaning in a direction or not a particular hypothesis that you have. The key is the number of var variables. So as we're going into talking about what experiments we're gonna run, I want you to be thinking about small, tiny little tests where if we only ran five of them, we should know what we need to know to then maybe do the next set of tests. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples that have already come in. I think Ben and Emily asked for some volunteers. So hopefully if you're on this call. It should be uh, Buzzy and is it Rolodex? Do I have, are you guys here? Yes. Yep. Okay, awesome. Great. There you are. Hi, hey, Angie. Um, okay, so we're, I'm going to ask you guys for feedback on these based on what you've heard me talk about so far. So this is Buzzy, I think. Yes? Yep. Okay. So based on what I've just said, because I know you all were listening intently, there's a set of assumptions on the left, and there are some MVP tests that have been proposed to validate these assumptions. So take a minute to read them. And this is part of learning as an entrepreneur is being comfortable getting feedback and critiques because you're going to get that a lot, like all the time. Everyone's going to have an opinion. So, Alec, is this yours? Yes. Okay. So, and I have Alec and, um, and Angie. So, so you two don't count. I want you two to be ready for feedback. So raise your hand if you have some initial reactions to these assumptions and the tests that are planned for these. I know y'all have thoughts. Parents are searching for solutions to help their teens navigate puberty. So the test plan is an ad. How do we feel about that? Good 
Katie, I'm going to pick on you. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking like, I would, I don't know if it counts as a test, but that's the type of thing where I'd want to like really talk to parents and kind of go a little bit deeper, um, into their psychology and how they're thinking. Um, because there's clearly what you're teasing out is there a lot of, there's a lot of emotion, um, in this puberty process that you're trying to address. And I think that um, something static like an like an ad and, and just the hard data points that you'd get is probably um, not going to tease out that emotional element of this process. And so I, I'd lean towards like a more in-depth customer interview to, to better understand these pieces. Okay, can I push you a little bit harder? It's great feedback so far, Katie. Let's go beyond the interview. What else could we do? Parents are searching for solutions to help their teens navigate puberty. An ad test certainly demonstrates that maybe they're searching. What else could you do to get underneath that a little bit more? Help Alec out. Um, yeah, I guess like you can you can uh, put something put something out there um, and like see how people actually use it. Um, I don't know if you're. It sounds like the idea is that there's a there's a te texting solution. Um, so I'm, I'm most curious in like, I guess, number three, so you can see um, like how much do they engage? Like, do they drop off pretty quickly uh, with something like that? Um, do they ask a lot of questions um, in that process? And um, are they like curious to ask for more features um, if, if you put something out there like that? Um, and that feels like it can be super low tech too. Yeah. What's your reaction to that, Alec? Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thanks for those thoughts. I think on the emotional side, what's not included here in the first test is part of, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the ad testing is testing different sort of um, snippets of text of what are sort of the emotional grabbers that are uh, parents are most reacting to. So what are those click through rates that, how do those change of if you emphasize that it's science backed versus emphasizing privacy, what, what are the sort of emotional elements that are being, um, that are speaking most to parents. So I think that's a great call out that I'll, I'll have to do with the ad tests. And then I think um, part of the onboarding process that, that you mentioned, uh, Katie, could be that um, for the second element of, of wanting to test the payment, I could see some of the metrics of along how far do they get into the onboarding process, like how much where do they fall off in the journey to see um, where sort of the, the, the experience is broken. Um, so I think that's like a metric that I could, could measure in that second test as well. Yeah, great. I, and as I said earlier, I would deter you from the payment part now, because I, I, I honestly think you have too much to learn still about what's actually going to work for teens and their parents before you get into what they pay for it or whether that's a barrier yeah. or not. Uh, if you build something that they find is incredibly useful or the student, the, the teens are enjoying it or the parents are like, thank God, I don't have to have this talk now, like this product's going to do it for me. They'll pay anything for that, probably within reason, obviously. But the idea is that you'll have a better sense of like demand, right? If you say to them, this is going away and they have two other kids who are going to get, about to go through puberty, they'll be like, no, 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 please. Like, what are you going to charge me for it? Because I still want it. Uh, my other reaction to this, and then we'll go to the next one, is I love, love, love. My favorite thing is your test number two here, because this is really where you're going to find out what actually happens, right? This is a scrappy text space. I've had tons of startups do this where all we're going to do is just text you stuff. And you're, you're going to know right away if the texting base, uh, text based communication, if it's less awkward, you're guessing it will be, but it's trusted. Trust is an interesting thing. You're going to have to figure out what will be, what is trust and how do you know you're actually gaining trust, but you're engaging, you're actually engaging with the customer right away, right? Whereas ads and other things are still, there's a veneer between you and the customer. Okay. So think Great. about that a little bit more, but love it. Good thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Andy, the next one's yours, I think. Yes. Uh, and so this is Rolex. Yes. Are we calling it Rolodex? Is that what we're calling it? Yes. Okay. Um, and so the assumptions are young professionals, 22 to 40, okay with having their WhatsApp and messages scraped to determine what's the problem. Will you just be clear with everyone what the problem is so that we're all clear? 
Yes, it would be a tool that you could ask it questions and it will recommend connections, LinkedIn connections of yours to reach out to and assign them a strength of connection and then recommend which context to reach out to for various questions. And I'm going to push you a little harder. What's the problem that you're trying to solve for? Is that users have a lot of LinkedIn connections, but they don't know how to leverage those connections and what to do with them. Okay. I'm going to push you again. I'm going to do my five whys with you. What's important about that? So they have connections. They don't know what to do with them. What's the problem they're trying to solve? So I have three personas. One of them is job seekers. So people who are looking for jobs um, and they would want to tap into their LinkedIn contacts, but don't know how to. Um, the second one would be people who travel off for work. And let's say you're in New York City for the week and you want to know who of your contacts to reach out to. Um, and then the third one would be small businesses who are looking to expand their network, but don't know who in their contact they should be reaching out to to expand their network. Okay. We have three very different personas here, right? Um, the general thing is I've got a network. How, how can I take better advantage of the network for different types of use cases? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with that context and understanding, similar to how we did uh, for the first one, what's feedback folks have on the ideas for these tests? AD, there's an AB test that describes privacy. Uh, the assumption is if we give them that, that privacy commitment, they'll be more willing to let us scrape their WhatsApp. Yes? So does, yes. does, does a privacy commitment help or not in, in allowing people to do that? Um, free networking services to students, young professionals by an HBS student, uh, to help them feel more comfortable about assigning a score of connection to their contacts. Yeah. And then the last one is for small business owners, ad campaigns, targeting small businesses to see, I'm guessing this is gauging interest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What are our reactions to this? to pick someone again. Uh, Ernesto, I see you. What's your reaction to these? Can you hear me there? Yep. Um, I don't know about the, the privacy concerns. Um, I don't know, even if even if it's there, you know, something showing how far you can go in terms of privacy. Do they trust what the what they're gonna get, like the system, what they're gonna pull from, you know, your messages, emails, or your WhatsApp, right? And if the company's gonna use that data for something else. So just do they trust it? How far can they trust it? I don't know. Yeah, how, how would you measure trust? Um, well, I guess initially if they do sign up uh, or if they, if, if, if I don't know, if, they, if something's pop up showing, like asking like, are you okay if we do this? You know, just literally asking you, are you okay if we do this, yes or no? It's like a test, just mm -hmm. testing that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, without, we don't see all the details here, uh, but uh, in terms of how the test would actually run, but that, you know, asking versus having a privacy commitment. I'm assuming what you're saying with the AB test here is some people will just not get the privacy commitment. You'll just ask if they can do it and they'll do it or not. Okay. Okay. Any other ones that jump uh, in terms of the other two tests, Ernesto? Um, I don't know if they, um, low head, low head hunting. Um, what was the question? Um, no, I think that's, that's it. You don't have other feedback? No, that's it. 
Okay. I'm going to get to, to cut to the chase because I also want you guys to get into your breakouts. Here's my reaction to some of these. Uh, I, I think the, 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 does a privacy commitment matter or not is it in and of itself is a decent, very simple light test, right? Some people are going to ask, some people were, were not. I'm not sure what it's answering for you beyond that in terms of whether this is something that people even want, but it certainly is a nice, elegant, if I just want to know, like they'll do it or they won't, if this is going to be my approach, great. I think that's a, a beautiful AB test. The free networking services to students by an HBS student and then getting a LinkedIn um, and asking them to score is like, I see at least four tests in there. It's really complicated. You get too many variables, right? Free networking by students, by HBS students, getting a list of LinkedIn you know, um, contacts and asking them to score. Every single one of those is an individual thing. And by glomming it all together, you're not really sure where, what's really making it compelling or not. So if this is a failure and, and nobody wants to score their LinkedIn connections, you don't know if it's because they didn't appreciate the free networking, they didn't want to do it with an HBS student, that it was just a student in general they didn't want to do. Like, there's too much here for me to unpack to know whether or not this is going to tell me anything. Does that make sense? So I would encourage you, even though it might seem slow and arduous, to peel these apart and think about them as each individual test, right? Because any one of them would answer just is free networking to help them get a job by itself is interesting. Is that what people want? It doesn't really answer anything for you around scores and whether scores are really gonna make a difference for them, right? Which is really at the root of what you're trying to learn about. So I would try to get closer to, I like the idea of list of LinkedIn contacts and ask them to score is a very simple by itself, just ask them to do that, right? If you think the networking services or the advisory services are what get them in the door, I would have that as your backup plan. So like, let's just start with this asking people if, Nobody responds, then we can see if we create a networking event or something, then we can get people to participate. Okay. And then on the small business owners, and this one's tricky because I think you've got the beginnings of a diffuse product here if you're trying to solve for both this and for job seekers. Um, it's a very different audience, but obviously social media ad campaign, uh, just testing pricing, and that might be premature. So that's my reaction to that. That makes sense to everybody. Questions about this? Karina. Yeah, I also think like I was reading this and I think one thing that could be helpful is even taking one step, like step back and instead of going straight into, are they willing to like rank their connection strength? Asking someone if you can even observe their LinkedIn communications first before you even ask about like, scraping WhatsApp data, because my guess there is you'll learn a lot about A, people's willingness to reach beyond their first strength of connection. And then B, you can also monitor response rates because in the event that people are way more willing to make intros, maybe strength of connection isn't the variable to solve for. So I'm sure you've already thought about this in your customer interviews, but I do think there's value to even observing their LinkedIn communications thus far. Great suggestion. You're really just talking through like, you're looking for a job, go search your LinkedIn, but talk out loud as you do it. I wanna know what you're looking for and, and, and what criteria you're putting in the filters and those types of things will tell you a lot before you get into scoring. Great, just give you um, a couple more tips. When you're meeting with customers, interviewing, observing, whatever it is you're doing, always record your sessions. Most customers will be fine with you asking if you can record. Ideally, video, because you'll see the, the emotional responses, the body language, all that other stuff, but audio is okay too, uh, if they feel more comfortable with that. You can also ask people to do things when you're not there, especially if it's any kind of personal related thing or confidential thing of like, can you just record it or talk out loud? I don't need to be there. I just need to listen to it for my startup thing that I'm doing. You can promise them you'll delete it, that no one else will see it. But it's invaluable, especially if you have other team members who can't be there for them to be able to see what, what you saw, or maybe they'll pick things up that you didn't see. Getting the emotional responses. Uh, work in pairs whenever possible. So if you're solo right now, if you have a friend who can tag along with you or find an undergrad or somebody who can do it with you, 
again, they may see things that you don't see. It's nice when you have one facilitator, uh, one interviewer, one observer. Uh, it's nice when you can get those different views of things, especially if you're facilitating a test, you might just miss things that somebody who's just watching will pick up and observe. So video helps with that, but it's also nice when you can have another person. Maintain consistency. I've seen a lot of tests fail because you had three different people do three different things, or you met with five different people using the rule of five, uh, but you didn't follow a script and you realize you said things to two out of the five that you didn't say with the other ones. And then you're not sure if you really have a clean test or not. So it's just best practices for testing. Material, same thing. Make sure you have the same pen, the same paper, the same screen, the same whatever it is, because you're going to have a much cleaner test if you do that. Especially for those of you doing B2B, offer NDAs if it allays concerns. You can scrape any of them. They're, they're uh, on the internet everywhere. You can use them, although sometimes businesses will ask that you use their paper. Uh, that's okay. Uh, it shouldn't be anything extravagant, just a simple like one or two page NDA if that makes them feel more comfortable. And then usually they'll let you do more. Uh, if you're working with kids, some of you are, uh, make sure that you have parent authorization. I've had a lot of students get tripped up because they started talking to kids under 18 and that's not a place you want to go without parental written parental uh, authorization or at least the parent has to be in the room when you have the conversation so just make sure that you're careful about that uh, you can totally leverage your HBS grad student approach especially if you don't actually have a business yet if you are um, pre-incorporation in the early 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 stages you can get a lot further when you say I'm at a Harvard grad student and I'm just doing some research because you are, it's legit. And it often is like, people like that. Oh, I get to talk to a Harvard graduate student about like my problems, um, businesses or consumers. So definitely lean into that because it can be an easy way to get into doors that you otherwise might not get into. And last but not least, be scrappy. Uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough. There are so many things that you all can do. I shared a whole bunch of examples with you, but there's so many things that you can do uh, without building technology, without having to like, even with, if you're planning on doing something with AI or GPT, whatever, uh, there's still a lot you can do before you leverage those tools to make progress on, on your testing and learn a lot. Okay, um, last but not least, I just wanna show this really quick because we're running out of time, but all this discovery work that you're doing, it is great when you can pop it into a journey map. This is just a classic example. My toolkit students have seen this before to map out the emotional response along the journey and identify the opportunities along the way. So uh, again, you'll have a slide deck uh, after this to, to refer back to this, but it's a nice way to synthesize the data that you're getting through your interviews, your testing, your observations, all those things to lay it all out and say like, these are a bunch of problems we saw. Here's the ones we think we could actually solve. So you'll be clear about persona and problems when you do that. Think about touch points. Are they using computers? Are they having conversations? Are they making phone calls? And it will give you all these insights around the empathy for personas and um, the problems that you're solving. That I think is my last slide. I have like five minutes for any last open questions. AMA, you can ask me anything about your testing or anything else this summer. I'm totally reachable and bookable starting the end of June for office hours. Uh, for people who are interested in my course, we can talk about their, that as well um, in those sessions, but any open questions, raise your hands if you have other questions that I didn't answer.